I should have been honest with you from the start. I wasn't born to show the error of the ways I was born to murder the world. So yeah, I would go for the 100% solution if I had 100% power. I mean, if I could press a button right now and planet Earth just vanishes, yeah, I'll press it. Fine. No big deal. No skin off my hand. Um, you know, yeah, zap it. Fine. This year I see it as basically fail. It was a failed experiment. The whole life thing is insane. So yeah, stop it. Um, it's got nowhere to go. It's got nothing to do. So logically I can say, yeah, I'm pretty comfortable with that idea. You're defending an insidious system of, of grotesque, pointless suffering and I want to turn it off. Yeah, that would complete me. Bones are reanimated back into the world again to push the same sycophant fucking boulder up the same stupid hill for the tenth zillion time for absolutely no accomplishment but to create a bunch of wasted suffering. You do understand that's the dynamic I'm trying to stop. Now if you have some better way to stop it, describe a way. I do indeed have a better way. That better way is the one described by David Pierce on his website, The Hedonistic Imperative. It's linked in the underbar. It's an unrealistic, utopian, transhumanist, sci-fi vision of how neuroscience, nanotechnology, and genetic engineering can eliminate all the truly nasty pain and suffering that life experiences while keeping the good stuff and even improving it. And as far-fetched and improbable as the hedonistic imperative is, it is still more probable than either of Gary's two options, which are, one, convince enough people to stop having babies and to make laws against having babies to let the human race die out, or two, blow up the world or spread some deadly genetically engineered plague and destroy all life that way. The option of the hedonistic imperative is to just keep doing what neuroscience is already doing, studying the brain, and then medical science will use the results of that knowledge to eliminate pain and suffering in more and more intelligent and effective ways. First, with patients in serious pain or depression, but then spreading to wider use in the general population. Eventually, if the science keeps progressing, we will reach a point where we understand the systems involved in the production of pain and pleasure well enough that we can start seriously thinking about redesigning them. And the whole nervous system really does need to be redesigned. The human pain and pleasure system is a huge kludge. Pain and pleasure evolved long before reason and human level consciousness arrived on the scene. In fact, reason and consciousness seem to have evolved in order to override bad, out-of-date instincts and simple pain and pleasure inputs. For example, in order to use the newly invented spear to defend themselves against tiger attack, our ancient ancestors might have had to overcome the instinct to run in fear and instead stand and fight the tiger. Reason alone, not instinct, had to tell them they could not outrun a tiger. They could only, maybe, run faster than their comrades but they could fight the tiger with a proper weapon. Today, a species such as our own no longer needs pain as we have known pain because we are capable, in theory, of intelligently working out what is good for us and what damaging events we should avoid because we evolved from creatures that needed this nasty dose of pain to drive into their memory the kind of lessons that we can learn with a less nasty inducement. Reason and consciousness got built on top of this kludgy pain and pleasure system which has become nothing but a very poor kind of onboard diagnostic system in the human being. 
a diagnostic system that gives us very faulty indicators of what is really good and bad for us. So we can now imagine a future where you can redesign your own pleasures, decide your own intentional objects, and replace pain with a less nasty diagnostic system. We might create a delicious feeling of absolute well-being that would surpass anything contemporary neurochemistry can achieve as a baseline feeling we live with most of the day. And then we could trade in our sense of pain for a less nasty feeling, like a warning tingle and an onboard AI doctor, the best expert system we can design that pops up a transparent computer screen behind our eyeballs that tells us what organ or appendage has been damaged and what should be done about it. And because this possibility of eliminating pain in the not too distant future exists, Gary's proposed solution of genocide falls victim to the same counter-argument that suicide does. It is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. So I'm a genocidal maniac, so again, that terminology is okay to use. I would say, you know, genocidal is okay, maybe if you take it literally, um, but we know what that word is. He admits it. His goal is global genocide, the end of humanity, intelligence, awareness, and consciousness itself. To me, a universe without intelligence, awareness, and consciousness is just wasted space. The antinatalist sees no value in anything but avoiding suffering. But I think the things we have achieved are worth the suffering, and that contradicts the first premise of the antinatalist argument, that avoiding suffering is the most important thing there is. Avoiding suffering is about as valuable as saving money. You don't want to waste it, but you will have to spend your current comfort level sometime in the future. Otherwise, there is no point to having it. And if you doubt the comparison of pain and money, or rather comfort to money, consider this. How much money would you take to have a sterilized needle stuck in your arm? It's the level of pain we get when we donate blood and give away a little comfort for others. I think with no donation value, that for $150, I'd let someone stick a sterilized needle in my arm as long as there is no lasting damage. Sure, it will be different for different people. You may have to pay Warren Buffett or Bill Gates a couple million dollars to stick a needle in their arm, and I wouldn't be surprised if they turned out to be regular blood donors who gave away their pain for free, but they also give away their money. Now, you may be saying that the needle in your arm is trivial and not like the suffering you need to address. So consider this question. Would you suffer the most intense pain a human being can experience before fainting or doing lasting damage for just five minutes if you were paid $10 million? I would, and if you feel the same way, if your pain is that kind of monetary value, then you can't say that avoiding suffering is the most important thing in the world. Money would be more important to you. Some antinatalists have, I believe, claimed that our pleasures are illusory and only the pain is real. But that is biologically impossible because they are produced by the same brain with the same neurochemistry. So, if the pleasure is an illusion because it is merely a brain state, then so is the pain. From what framework can you even make the outrageous claim that pain is more real than pleasure? If anything, from a subjective standpoint, it is the pleasure that is more real than the pain. I'm going to link a lecture by Alan Bossbaum, Pain in the Brain in the Underbar. In the lecture, Bosbaum asked people in his audience to re-experience the most intense pain they ever felt. You can't do it, but we can re-experience in our imagination past loves and other pleasures. I'll leave you to think about all that for now. 
Whether I pick up the topic of antinatalism again will depend on if I get responses to this video. Good night.